Buonasera Alici e benvenuti. Thank you for coming. I am Lin Fadusa and I have been a, an inhabitant of these wondrous hills since the great generous Atlas crowned them with such grand lofty towers. No, I'm just kidding. My name is Leonora Bernardi, poet and playwright. Oh, clearest fountains, you that bring life to the fields of Tuscany, of the great Grand Duca Ferdinando. The muses will happily come to this villa and to these gardens to live by your soft, graceful murmuring. They will sing the true praises of the great demigods with noble and resounding voices. They will sing of the wise Grand Duquesa Christine of her piety, her valor, her courtesy, all of which, like a flaming sun, adorn her with spectacular rays. And they will see and hear a little play that I have written called Clorili. I am very happy to present it to you now. But what are these unhappy events that I foresee? In such a happy, such a joyous age, will they really take place in these woods? And, and if the golden age does shine today, why then will it not shine here? Ah, oh, now I understand. Love is the reason that cruel tyrant who encircles the souls of others as he so pleases with torment and sorrow. Love is a blind little boy who, taking the bridle of reason from others, all too often sees miserable lovers to ruin and death. And you will see him reigning mercilessly tonight over the noblest shepherd of these woods. You will see the hills cry out with the fiery sighs of bitter lament. And you will see new streams of tears drench the grass, gushing from the eyes of lovers. But I will also announce to you that all of these sufferings will come to a happy end, for I do not want to trouble, not even with the smallest cloud, the great light of shining hope. No, no, no. I, with all of my power, will take the nymphs and the shepherds' sad, unfortunate stories and make them happy ones. 
I will lift these sadness from afflicted hearts. Instead of sorrowful sighs and laments, I will make the hills and the countryside sing with happy voices and ring out with the sweetest and most lovely sounds. Allora, on with our play. Avanti con lo spettacolo. Please, follow me to the gardens. Oh, how the dawn appears in the east today. Even more beautiful than usual. With her rosy hair, and, with her rosy face and golden hair. And how the hills laugh, and how the birds salute this fine day. Yes, I'm full of fresh hope that this cheerful day will end my long suffering. Oh, mortal Jove, let it be so. But wait. Is that my dear friend Elkanay I see approaching from afar? It is he. My eyes have not set sight on him in quite a long time now. Not a happier or sweeter meeting could befall me than one with my dear beloved friend, il mio caro e amato Alfezi Beo. And if a happy morning foreshadows a happy day, this one surely will be most pleasant and most fortunate. And where are you headed so early in the morning? <laughs> to the temple, perhaps? I was going to the temple, as you say. And as I made my way there, I was thinking about a dream I had a few hours before daybreak. It filled my breast with both happiness and foreboding. I had a similar dream myself, in fact, in the same hour. Really? Though, since I've always considered dreams little value, I gave it no credence. Mm, although dreams can often be false, a good dream can predict the truth. Yes, but among thousands and thousands of dreams filled with lies and falsehoods, mm. you will scarcely ever find a single true one. Mm. But tell me yours, Alcane, and then I will tell you mine. In my dream, I had a most beautiful and noble dove, una colomba. Nobile e leggiadra, whom I had raised for many years with great pleasure and care. She flew away from me to follow the most noble male dove who ever lived. I was left feeling dismay, and I tried in vain to find my dove again. At last, I seemed to see her swoop down into the cypress fountain, there to find her beloved mate, dead on the ground. She murmured in sorrow, and falling cruelly upon herself, she tore at her breast with her claws and her beak, ripping off plumage. Her blood rained down in a dire and piteous stream. Just when it seemed she had reached her final hour. Suddenly, from these very same woods, her twin flew up. Seeing her friend in such a terrible state, she plucked herbs from the ground, one whose virtue cured my noble dove at once. And so she flew back into the forest with her companion. I did not see my dove for a long time, but then she returned alone to the fountain to discover her beloved mate who beyond belief was still alive. And so she returned to her old nest, more beautiful, happier, and more dear to me than ever. And this, Alfizibeo, questo era, Il mio sogno. And now, I wish to tell you what I hope and what I fear. You must remember that when my dear beloved Nisa departed this life to ascend to heaven, she left behind Dalinda with me. Dalinda, our dear beloved daughter. After an agreement I had made with Ergasto, Philemone's father, I was planning Dalinda's marriage to Philemone with great, great joy. But then, suddenly, 
One night, in secret, Delinda ran away, I know not how. Oh, unhappy night, how your dark, long shadows still weigh on my heart. And since then, I have had no news of Delinda, none at all, much to my woe. Just now, I was thinking, perhaps this dream is the prediction of my beloved Delinda's longed-for return. Oh, if it were true, how happy you would be, old man! Quanto saresti felice! But when I remember the sight of that dove bloodless on the ground, I am horrified again. And this is how I live, Alphese Bale, between doubt and hope, between happiness and sadness. Count truly amazing things to me, Alcune. But in keeping with the laws of perfect friendship, I want to discover every hidden thought. For you see, we have been friends for so long now. Dare I ask you, why did your own Delinda run away? At first, I did not want to renew my own pain along with yours. I felt a bit of grief myself when my own son, Felinio, ran away from me. He too left me never to return. Will I ever see him again? Ever hear your voice? Que dolore, que dolore. Nonostante, I shall respond to your question. You must know that Delinda was always very wary of my desire to have her married. I had hoped that the arrival of this Filemone, with his wise and lovely ways, would banish such foolish thoughts from her head. And so, I told her of her impending marriage. In response, she turned mute pale and cold. Indeed, she seemed to have lost all feeling. After a long silence, she cried out in an angry voice, Father, ah, may your desire to have me obey you be fulfilled only with my death. She said this to me. Oh, and then she went quiet again while two fountains of grief gushed forth from her eyes. She ran away. In a fury, tutta furiosa! Huh. Our house, which should have been filled with joy and celebration, instead became a pool of tears, of sorrow and sighs. Delinda left me. I know not whether it was love who was her escort, or Diana herself. Whether it was one or the other, it doesn't matter. Non importa più. And ever since, I have been deprived of all good and all hope. Even if lamenting things that cannot be fixed seems a folly. Let me tell you this, Alcone. You made a mistake back then when you tried to tie her against her wishes in a knot so strong can only be loosened by death. See, in every other matter, children are subject to their father. And God and nature have conceded them both for their liberty. For you see, even when a dark storm comes, a more serene sky does often appear. I do not know how to explain it, but an indescribable hope still snakes sweetly around my heart. But come. Alfezi Bale, tell me about your dream. I will tell you the whole thing as we make our way to the temple. Da. For you see, the fledging sun is turning the mountain peak, so we must go now. Yes, andiamo, amico. Andiamo. Al tempio. Al tempio. Andiamo. that hurt 
heard him play Even the billows of the sea Hung their heads and then lay by In sweet music is such a because of your advice and your command. Did he not tell you that at the fountain by the laurels? If he did obey his elderly father's wish, tied his neck to the marital yoke, it was with much sorrow. For you know very well he was often seen wandering around the town, crying out the name Clorili and begging death to rescue him from his bitter grief. Beautiful nymph, does it not hurt your heart to see him so close to death and not help him? Armila. I was already not believed when you had to speak to me of this man whom I hate so much. Our flock of sheep could not hate the wolf more than I hate him. There was a time when I loved him. Yes, more than these eyes, more than life itself. So when he gave that wedding ring to the beautiful Delinda, I thought I would die of sadness. Out of my mind with grief, I passed day and night crying in the forest. How many shepherds asked, has Clorilli gone out of her mind? Alas, how many times did I come close to killing myself? Certainly Sylvia and La Costa, my most faithful companions, can attest to this. With their help, and after long suffering, I was able to recover my original liberty. A perilous liberty, since by regaining it you lost the most beautiful, the wisest, the kindest shepherd Tuscany has ever seen. You'd have done well to add the most faithful to that description. But Armila, to strip you of all your arguments and reasonings, you know he promised me not one, but a thousand times he would become my husband. Now while I happily awaited to learn the day and hour of the promised wedding, he told me his father wanted him to marry another nymph. He hurt me, and heaven knows it, which is why he was so quickly robbed of his precious Delinda. Besides, Philomone doesn't lack the attentions of other nymphs now women much more beautiful than I, so don't waste your time uselessly observing the one who, who flees from him and hates him, but think instead about those whom he pursues and admire him. He cannot pursue others because you are his life, because his stars are fixed aligned. It is clear he cannot be anyone but yours. That is why the heavens took Delinda away from him so quickly. The miserable Philomone will never belong to any woman but Clurili. And just as he cannot belong to anyone but me, I too cannot belong to anyone but myself. How is it possible in this age that someone nature has granted so much beauty and goodness can be ruled by the ugly vice of ingratitude? I was never ungrateful, my dear Armila, for I've returned false love with true love. So be yourself again with time. Now, if the fault was yours, must he alone suffer such long, harsh pains? 
but let's say he did make a mistake. Isn't this enough for you? Isn't it enough, even for someone so cruel as you, to have him tormented like this? But change, beautiful nymph. Change your cruel and proud desires right now so that you don't bring death to that wretch and shame and blame to yourself. Don't worry, Armila. That man is in no hurry to kill himself. I was close to death myself once too, but praise the heavens, I'm still alive and speaking. And besides, even if Philomone had got mad and tried to kill himself, I don't see how you could blame me. Oh, what sublime honor, what clear praise, what prayers there are to have killed one who loved you more than his own eyes. Tell me, do you place such trust and happiness in these golden locks, in these fresh roses? Ugh, you proud, ungrateful nymph. Before the day turns to evening, I will see if this dart of mine can fell some savage beast. Let me conclude, Armila. You will sooner see the waves of the Munione flow back to their source, and sooner see the Atlas Mountains go wandering than you will hear it said amongst nymphs and shepherds that Clarilli and Philomone are friends again. Farewell. Peace be with you. I take my leave. Follow the wild ones for even crueler and prouder than they are. Go and flee every vestige of humanity that marks the sand. <sighs> If my prayer, so many times answered, were able to soften the craggy peak of this horrid mountain, who could believe they were unable to soften that maiden's heart? <sighs> Miserable Philomone, if the only hope you have is my help, I'm afraid you won't get very far. You are called a god for good reason. And you are the most powerful god of them all. For you govern the world and rule the stars and unite and temper the elements that are in discord. But how is it that heaven, hell, and earth all fear your great power? And Chlorelia alone scorns you and flees from you. Oh, powerful god, how can you possibly bear it? How can you allow such pride to dwell in a lady's heart? And you, cruel nymph, if my pining can provoke pity in the most savage beasts, how can it not awaken beauty pity in your beautiful breasts? Why does the sun of your eyes not rise brighter than ever before to greet these unhappy eyes? Oh, dear and beautiful one, there was once a time of great joy in my life when my love was not only dear to you, but you swore to me that without it, Life would be impossible to enjoy. How is it that my most unfortunate happiness has disappeared in an instant? Oh, how can it be? But why should I lament any longer? It only disturbs and darkens the rays of my beautiful son, Chlorelli. Just die now, Philomone, and live happily, Chlorelli, for no one will ever take notice of your sin. For you don't deserve pity, since you didn't know how to employ it yourself. And no one took Lurithi from you but yourself. You were the maker of your own misery. What could your father's will have possibly done if your own blind desire hadn't surrendered to his wishes? Die now, you wretched shepherd, since you have no hope of staying alive in so much pain. So you found yourself in the end, Fitz Simone. Come with me to the foot of the hill where Alante and Percy have sent their nest to chat birds. You go on ahead, Corabante. But I will stay here alone to cry. Now is not the time to cry, for the beautiful spring reanimates the songs, the hills, the men, and the animals, and sweet songs of nymphs and shepherds are heard from every corner of the forest. I sang while well, my heart burned with fire for my beautiful nymph. I sang as I saw the pure and beautiful heavens rain sweetness down on a serene face. But it is now my fate to have that fire extinguished, and instead of sweetness, Anger and harshness pour down from the beautiful sky. So I will cry until the day when my heart expires from grief. For my tears invite mercy. I cry, and in crying, I do not wish for help or for pity. 
or that this short life may soon resolve and end itself through grief. Hope that words and prayers do more than tears and sighs. Stop your crying, then, and talk and pray. How do you expect me to pray? How do you expect me to speak to one whose feet are always set to run from me? See only the true signs and effects of a stubborn will and often hardened soul. But keep hoping, Philemone. Perhaps Armila has not tried everything yet? Become yourself again, Philemone, and see how you waste the bloom of your best years. Come back now, Philemone. Become yourself again, recover your original liberty, and in the ancient seat, let love return from where reason drew it out. Were it in my power to follow your most wise and reasonable advice, Corribante, I would follow it. But how can I, when love has robbed me of all power of will of my own? No, kind Corribante, I am not myself. I gave myself to Glorily the day I dared to gaze too fixedly and ardently into the light of her beautiful eyes. Now if it is her wish that I die from love, I will die, and my death will be sweet and gentle. I only wish to receive this one last gift of mercy, that before my death she might say, Philemone, farewell. Philemone, adio. Listen to this, all you miserable lovers. But hope, keep hoping, Philemone. Keep trusting in Armila's help and in mine as well. You will see that face and that heart again. It was a lover's face and a lover's heart before that became of your scornful enemy. Therefore, keep hoping. And in the meantime, let's go find Alonde and Tercy. <sighs> let's go where you want. But don't try to make me wish for a happy fate. Dear woods, I have returned to see you once more. I well remember the scenes of my sweet and happy pleasure in you. Among you, hallowed heroes, among you, I tasted a sweetness that I can never hope to taste again. Take a look at this miserable shepherd who once made the name Delinda resonate so sweetly across these mountains. Do you recognize that unhappy Foligno who left you to follow his life's path? I am that man, the one who has become an abode of infinite pain. Oh, Delinda, my love, my beautiful son, where do you hide your light? Can it be that you've passed on to make heaven more beautiful, or do you still live and breathe and love me? Still unlucky, Foligno, do you allow a place for such starved and meager hope? Do you still run from death? Do you not recall the cruel spectacle? It was here, at this fountain, that you saw her dart, and, and her veil, which you still have. Do you not see? Do you not see that the clear waters of this fountain are still, are still vermilion with her blood? Do you not see that the, the tracks of that cruel and pitless beast are still impressed upon this earth? Do you not hear her reproaching you with that promise you gave? Now she is dead and you live. You still live, O oh miserable shepherd. Do you not recognize the sound of that angelic voice? Why tarry further? I am coming, my love. I am coming, ready to follow you. But cruel fate, do you still prevent my death with someone's arrival? Well, I shall hide myself in this cave. And then, when he is gone, in the place where my beloved died, I will kill myself as well. Corribante told me that I should wait for her here, and that she would tell me what she had done with my nymph on my behalf. But I do not see her coming. Oh, I hope to God that her tardiness is not a sign of some evil hanging over me. And let not my hope, which she attempted to stir in this desperate breast of mine, be the cause of an even crueler death. But look, I see her from afar. Oh, she seems very happy. Oh, for pity's sake, love, let her bring an end to my fierce pain. I greet you with the good news that will put an end to your grieving. What? Was my dear nymph very happy, perhaps? Tell me I'm dying. 
Why do you speak of that? It is time for life and for the most happy kind of life at that. Oh, lucky me. Perhaps love's torch set hard ablaze once more. Dad, I do not know, but I do know that Armila said she would make every effort. And she believes that she can persuade her to listen to your words before the sun hides itself in the ocean. Fleeting hope. Why do you steal away from unhappy lovers so quickly? And Corribante, is this your happy news? But didn't I tell you that Armilla has tried in vain to get her to listen to me at least a thousand times? Then how do you know that she will not succeed in the end? Uh, it is easier to gather breezes in a net and to enclose the sea within a little jar than it is to change the stubborn will of a merciless nymph. Everything yields in the end with the time. And I need to believe that your faithful service will bring some mercy. My cruel, harsh destiny has left me without any hope of mercy. Fate is always changing from sad to happy. You will have mercy yet. And why should I hope? She bestowed her love on me, and now she denies me love, my cruel glory, Lee. And you also have love, which can be found where beauty and courtesy reign. <laughs> love does not dare allow his wings to approach her beautiful sun, which, much like the brilliant sun, burns and consumes everything in sight. Even the sun feels the fire of love beyond his own ardor. But you know that in Clorelli's case, it is perhaps the flame that can be seen, and the frost that remains hidden. Frost also disperses in the face of mighty heat. Every great flame mellows with the cold, chilly ice. Then today will be the day that either Philemone will be deprived of love, or Clorelli will become a lover. And why, Corabante? Either her frost will mellow your fire, or your fire will melt her frost. It shall not be either one or the other. For love does not allow for moderation before my beautiful sun. Either give me all frost or all fire. But do I not see Armila approaching from afar? And she seems to be all spells. I hope she has good news for you. A wretched lover does not dare to hope, for he's already hoped many times in vain. Not even the labor Atlas expended to hold up the weight of the heavens is as great as what I have suffered to bend the will of such an obstinate nymph. Oh, what I have said, oh, what I have done. If pity for these unhappy lovers had not gripped me, I could say that I would have abandoned this enterprise. <laughs> but here are Philemone and Corbante. Can it be that happy chance has brought about this happy meeting? When you still bring most courteous Armila. In the end, your beautiful Clorelia has promised that she will listen to oh, you. Oh, what new emotion is this? When is this possible? Dear nymph, pray do you tell me the truth. Are you of such little faith that you think I would joke about this with you? It is certain and it is true. Oh, if I do not have faith in your true words, Armilla, it is because only one thought moves me. It could be that she, annoyed by your insistent prayers, relented to your demands at the moment, but does not plan on following through in her heart. Do not worry. Clearly has never gone back on her promises. Alas, may heaven wish it so. But I fear it will be the opposite. Be happy now, Philemone. Soon this grief will be behind you. <laughs> yes, for soon this life will be behind me. But when will I speak with her, Armilla? When? We agreed that she would come here in half an hour, and you will be able to speak to her here. But I must remind you, Philemone, to set aside all your tears and sighs and all your laments. Now is the time to be an ardent and valorous lover. Have you ever been in love, Armilla? I have been forever, and I am, and I will be for as long as I live. Were you truly in love? What do you mean was I truly in love? I loved my Lacone more than I loved life itself while he lived amongst us. But since bitter death had robbed his body of his beautiful soul and placed it in heaven, I have loved and honored him almost as a divine power. Therefore you must know that true love has no courage. If love is such a strong and valorous God and reigns in your heart, why does he allow fear to live in there as well? Tell me, who is the cause of that? She who teaches me to love and to revere. If she teaches you to love, she should teach you to be bold. For in the noble heart, love shows himself bold and strong. Bold and strong! But I must go and find Clarelief. I expect you to bring Filmona here at the appointed hour. Go on, I'll bring him, but I'll go first for hot. I'll come too. Let's be going. Let's go, andiamo. Minister showed us the ways of the holy sacrifice. 
And with great piety he showed us, and he concealed my bitter grief. I return much happier than when I left. <laughs> See, as has been said, Alfezi Bayo, it depends. It all depends. Who knows if our children, over whom our minds are so troubled now, will not, in their returning to us, bring back our former happiness a thousand times over. How true all of this? Yes. First, you see, he restored our lost happiness. For every happiness depends on me seeing my beloved son again, mm -hmm. my dear Felinio. But what did Aragosta say? Ah, he told me great things, great things about Cristila and Dinando, lovers and newlyweds of the great Dinando, because of whom we see, as far as the eyes can see, the corn rippling like gold across the hills and the fields. See, el grande Dinando, to whom Etruria's subject has placed his seat in the city that takes its name from the flower, La Bella Firenze, the city where noble customs bloom till this day. Ah, see, si, mi parlava di Dinando e della graziosa Cristila, the wise Cristila who breathes courtly air from her fair breast. Never did the Arno pay its tribute to the sea so proudly as since she came from Lorraine to Etruria, Chue, la bella Toscana. Woo. Oh, what a fortunate age. See, I do not know if I should call him Jove or Donando, hmm. or if I should call her Juno or Christina. Christina Juno. For you see, Jove certainly resembles Donando in Justo. value and in empire. Exato. Though Juno certainly resembles Cristilla <laughs> in knowledge and noble appearance. Yes, you, blessed couple, are our demigods, our fearless leaders. Oh, oh, uh, pardon, please pardon this old shepherd's clumsy words and accept my affection for reckless daring has disguised my humble soul. <laughs> A soul that can only mean so much. See, even if lamenting things cannot be seen to folly, mm -hmm. they shall understand. They shall understand. Exactly. It and we shall go in our fortunate age because, you see, we are going to our cabin where we will break ah, our fast and Finalmente, eh, si, abbiamo fame. Andiamo. Andiamo, let's go, because at my old age, I'd rather go rest and eat than wandering around all day. Allora, andiamo. Andiamo. Andiamo, andiamo amico, si. At last, Clorelli, you were nearly so late you would not have found me here. What took you so long? Armila appeared just when I caught up the dough and killed it. Ah, oh, brava! Yes. And uh, once again, she delayed me with her idle chatter, much longer than was necessary. I wasn't able to pry myself away before I promised her all that she desired. Before I could come to you, my Lacosta. Are you still being pursued by Armila? who harasses you on behalf of that Philomone. She follows me obstinately, and it seems as if this is only the start of it. Um, in the end, to save myself more annoyance, I promised her I would speak with Philomone, <sighs> but I swear to you it'll bring him so little joy that perhaps he will regret it. They do nothing but irritate us, those men who love, or rather men who pretend to love. Mm. But to tell you the truth, my Clarelli, I prefer to flee from them as I have always done, for they are rare masters of untrue words, and they know how to disguise fraud as a lover so effectively that you would think it the very truth. <laughs> First, they cover fraud's horrid, filthy face with a pale veil. <laughs> then they drape it amongst her shoulders in a pure mantle of tears. Oh. <laughs> A necklace wraps around her throat, made of promises that seem to blow away on the wind. Poof. 
<laughs> and around Fraud's brow can be a garland of flowers circling around the brow, circling that with lying sighs. And out of the inconstancy of their desires, they have extracted false promises from a false conch. Two hollow pearls with the false names love and faith. <laughs> then they adorn her hands and arms with various gems, polished bracelets that have seemed to be given the names of enticing flattery. And on Fraud's forehead can be read the words, to satisfy one's desires, all is permitted. <laughs> you speak the truth, La Casa, for even with their eyes they cry, in their mouths they sigh, <laughs> in their hearts they are laughing. And they already plot with these ministers of their mad desires to capture the noble prey of the hearts and souls of those simple and credulous nymphs mm. who are so ruled by their own foolish desire. No sooner will some unfortunate girl be taken in by their false images of love than they will quickly leave her, for they no longer respect her, and they will soon move their deceits in another direction, and they dare to call us inconstant and fickle. The most unfaithful and fickle nymph would seem like constancy itself to in comparison to even the most steadfast of shepherds. Oh, how the lovely Chalia spoke on this subject. If I thought I wouldn't bore you, I would tell you the story. You worry that you will bore me, but what can I possibly hear that would be as dear to me as denouncing this sex, which is so much our enemy? But who is this Chalia? Can she be the one the Po River reveres and honors above all nymphs? She to make blessed Tuscan shores joined herself in matrimony with Laudanio? Yes, of course, of her I was speaking indeed, of the charming Celia. Celia, glory of love, prize of the world, in whose beautiful visage lies eternal spring, and who holds the gold of the stars in her hair. Celia, in whose honest gaze chaste love sparkles forth, and in whose noble breast noble piety resides. I don't know if you remember, when she left the proud Roy banks of the Po and brought happiness to the lovely Tuscany, when she left to dwell on that sea where Aldranio has his noble lodging, stilling its waves with her fair sight. How can you ask if I remember? The waters of the little Mugnone too were made clear when that beautiful image was reflected in them of this I know not whether to call her nymph or goddess <laughs> when she trod the grass along its banks with her lovely foot as she made her way to the Arno. There, beside the shore that bathes the Cinque Terre, I found her seated above the wild beach with her lofty gaze so fixed upon the waves that she was not aware of me when I first arrived. Though when she noticed me, she welcomed me most gladly. I asked her why she stared so intently onto the sea and she graciously answered. I was looking out now at the shifting expanses of this our sea, and I was fashioning a parallel with the inconstancy and fickle faith of men. How calm does the ocean appear to us, how tranquil, how low and even are the waves, promising fair weather to sailors. Yet, if the wind god Aeolus releases even the mildest breeze from his hollow caverns, you will see that watery plain transform into mountains of waves. You will see that formerly tranquil aspect change into a cruel tempest, threatening war, open war to the miserable helmsmen. Just so are men. While they keep their fickle thoughts hidden deep in the perfidious caverns of their horrid hearts, they will cast sweet, gentle looks upon you, O oh, nymphs, in all mildness, breathing only peaceful semblances. But no sooner does a guileless nymph unfurl the sails of her fine desires upon this sea that seems so benign and calm. Then, in an instant, unleashing the infinite horde of their voluble wills, they will send her into such a turmoil that she seems now to rise to meet the stars, only now to tread the lowest point of the abyss, until finally she is miserably devoured by its unholy depths. And if the sea seems calm by the break of day, 
by noon you will see it become horrid and fearsome. The sea nourishes monsters, while man, like a new Proteus, breathes an immense flock of the foulest sea creatures, lascivious and impure desires, sensual and vile thoughts, idle pleasures, and a thousand other horrendous and monstrous things that I will not describe to you now as I see the sun's fiery rays extinguished before me. Thus she ended her speech and led me with it to her happy abode. <laughs> oh, the wise nymph made a worthy comparison. But even among so many faithless men and liars, certainly there could be one who is found faithful and true. But even among so many faithless men, I do not believe there ever was or ever will be one as unfaithful as Philomone. They are all tainted with the same tar. Sister, for my part, I prefer to flee from them as I have always done, to follow my Dahlia. This is true joy. This is happiness. To live following in her path, then they can't hurt you with their perfidious desires and their deceits. How it saddens me, Lacosta, that I did not see and understand this sooner. You will realize it enough in time. And now you can follow <laughs> this sweet life. <laughs> oh, I want to follow your advice. I want to free myself from Philomone as soon as possible. But come, let's rest ourselves a while by this fountain, for to tell you the truth, I am quite tired. <laughs> um, let's not stop here, my Lacosta, for uh, this is the very place where I must speak with Philomone. And where shall we go? To the fountain, underground, where I told Armila she would find me again. Well, let's go then, andiamo! Si, cara la casta, andiamo! Driven by hunger, fierce wolf emerges from the forest and runs quickly to where he believes he can better satisfy his most ravenous desires. In just the same way, amorous hunger pushes me towards the sacred caves where my goddess resides. So I come to this wood where Clarelli often comes alone in her solitude. Most deceitful Clarelli, who so detests my form, so detests my venerable and strong countenance. Who, Clarelli, who? I'm so fitting like a demigod. Most perfidious Clarelli. Who is it that you disdain and flee from, huh? A bear, a tiger, a fierce basilisk who can kill you with a look. I, who am like a god in these woods, and could conquer you by force, choose instead to to court you. And I add precious and, and, and welcome gifts to my entreaties, and, and that you still disdain me. And, and now you refuse me. Oh, oh vain, ill-advised nymph. Why do I vainly follow these desires? If I can make advantage of what nature has given me, why the great Jove himself changed into a swan, and then to a bull, and then to Diana. So who could blame me if I, too, follow the example of that great, most powerful god? Is this not the way of great men, if Jove has already done the same? I will, I will, Use force, Clarelli, in spite of yourself, and I will take you. As long as I can satisfy my own desires, what do I care if you are damaged, O oh prey of mine? I, I will go hide in these shrubs, waiting for my prey at the pass, a most rapacious hunter.
And now abandon all your hatred and contempt, for if this lasts much longer, the poor wretch's life will be over. And are you so cruel that you'll be able to look at him when he is dead, when you once loved him? Just remember now that the generous victor acquires greater glory by giving life and liberty to the conquered than one who is cruel and fierce and puts his captive into rough chains and kills him in the end. Your faithful lover surrenders himself to you and does not ask for his liberty, but only his life so that he may live forever as your faithful servant. To make you happy, Armila, I've promised to listen to him. And I will listen to him courteously. Now is that not enough for you? It is not that it is not enough, but I want you to listen to him as a lover, not as an enemy. I am not an enemy, but even less am I a lover. If you're not an enemy, then you're a lover. A lover of myself and not of him. If he lives within you, therefore you love him. So in which part of me does he live, Armila? I chase him from my heart, my memory erases him, and my thoughts flee from him as far as they can. He lives there in spite of you, thanks to the heavens and to the stars. Tell me. Do these beautiful eyes of yours, this golden hair, this beautiful face, and this pure breast, are they part of Clarelli or of another? They are mine, and I feel them as mine. And if Philomone lives only for these things, does he not then live in you? Haven't you told me a thousand times it was my eyes that wounded his heart? I did say this and I will say it again now more than ever. Oh, he who wounds kills and does not give life. Oh, nymph, how sly you are in hurting others. Now, don't you know that the wound from a poison dart can be soothed but never healed? And is this deadly poison perhaps hidden in my gaze? You did not have this poison. We had only just emerged from the beautiful Alcippe's womb, but only after the excellent master had tempered it and sprinkled it over you. By grace, tell me who this master is and how he prepared this poison that I hid in my eyes. This great master was love. It was he who took the whitest parts from the lovely mantle of the dawn and the darkest parts of the sky from the night. He robbed the stars of their celestial view and Put all these things together and refine his mixture over his bright, his burning fire and placed it in Clorelli's eyes. This is pure fairy tale. You think these words of mine are fables, do you? Don't you know that it was this beautiful gaze that first mortally wounded Philomone? And it is this gaze that keeps him alive today, even if he lives in Furman Week. And do you really believe, Armila, that a gaze can have such power? What do you mean, do you believe it? Don't you know what that great shepherd, who was born on the clear shores of the Sibeto and then sang so sweetly near the Po, once wrote about two bright eyes? What did he write about them, Armila? Here's what he said. Oh, oh beautiful, beautiful life. life! He said, oh, do you not realize that your rays allow you to renew a heart almost like a phoenix? and to heal the wounds that you have opened. Oh. <sighs> the tales of poets. Dreams and shadows. When angry love punishes you one day for a thousand offenses, he will send to your heart that sweet poison that sweetly kills. He will not do it if I do not wish it. Oh, you think he will not do it if you do not wish it? Believe that if you wish, but he will make you want this. Now stay and I'll fetch Philomone, for I promised him this. And meanwhile, I remind you to look happy and gentle in your expression and to soften your anger. Go ahead, for I will do what you command of me. This crazy woman believes that her well-contrived chatter will end my hatred for Philomone, but we will soon see how wrong she is. I would sooner kill myself with my own hands, then become a lover again. Come on now. Oh my God. No more waiting. Ah, oh, beautiful and dear nymph. I have caught you. No. I mean, alas, am I taken? Armila, Armila, back, my dearest companion. Are you There's no use screaming, you pitiless nymph. Shepherds, alas, come quickly! Help! Help. Ah, ah. Come, come with me to this cave. Oh. If you don't want me to drag you, you wicked nymph. Oh, shepherds, come quickly! Help! Help! Oh, son of a fight! Oh, cruel sailor! Leave this nymph alone, unless you 
want to feel the full strength of my blows. Why would I leave her? No, no, Rusconi will never do such a crazy thing. You won't leave her? Uh, we'll see about that. No, 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 let me go. Won't you, Rusconi? Just, um, follow me. You handsome satyr. Be gone from here and retreat back into the forest, you boorish beast! Ah! Oh, deceitful glory! I thank you, Shepherd, for your courteous help. For um, had you not been there, I. But what do I see? Is this not Foligno, my sweetest brother? Oh, Foligno, am I really seeing you or do I just think I am? Am I dreaming or am I awake? Is it the breeze or is it the shade? Or am I really seeing the true image of my Foligno? Oh, if it really is true that you are my brother, speak! <laughs> yes, clearly, dearest sister, you see the real thing, so no ego. After a long exile, I've returned back to my unhappy homeland. Oh, <laughs> Foligno, I cannot stop myself from embracing you. Oh, I can see you. I can touch you, and I can hardly believe it. What cruel fate took you away from us, my Foligno? And why did you hide the cause of your departure from your old father and your sister? Oh, as I will tell you, that wicked tyrant love took me from you. But... But, but what of our dear father? Is he still living? Our good father lives. Uh, yet his old age has made him weak and tired. There was a time when I thought he would return to heaven, abandoning the world since your departure brought so much pain, but... What happiness he will feel in his heart at your unexpected sweet return, which has been so long wished for and sighed for. Why do I delay? Why am I not running to my old father's now to announce the happiest of news? <laughs> Lest what caused such bitter pain at my departure cause excessive happiness at my return. Too, too much joy sometimes kills. I will therefore continue to delay. But tell me, meanwhile, about what I asked you. Since you asked me to renew my pain in speaking to you, dear sister, you'll hear your brother's miserable and sorrowful story. I had not yet turned seventeen when, when fate guided me to a place where, among many nymphs, there lived the, the most beautiful Delinda, like, like a bright star amongst a field of bright stars. In that moment, I rushed towards her like a moth, and I felt a flame consume my heart. She recognized my fire, and, and I knew that same flame flared within her as well. And together, we were happy. With me, she she enjoyed the, the the cool murmurings of a of a stream, or then the sweetest harmony of lovely birds. But but cruel fate changed my serene days into gloomy nights. For for Delinda's father decided to marry her to Philomone. What didn't she say or do to avoid that that undesired wedding? In the end, we decided to to leave this place and go and go somewhere that was happier and friendlier to our love, and so. We decided to meet here, at this fountain, that very night, where I believe she would be waiting for me. The love of my life. Instead, when I arrived, I, I saw nothing but dark and gloomy signs of her death. When I looked around, I didn't hear or see anything but a terrible silence. And I caught sight of the tracks of a monstrous beast on the ground. I saw the, the clear water of this fountain all bloody, and I saw there on the ground, oh cruel sight, a spear with a decorated tip. I picked up that, and this, this bloody veil. Oh, cruel moon, how could you lend light to such a sight? I saw stamped into the dart. Oh bitter sight, my beloved's name, and. So I recognize this veil. Oh, cruel case. How worthy of pity. Thus I, I saw, 
I saw my entire life extinguished. I wanted to scream, but I was, I was caught up by the, by the sounds of pain. I wanted to, to kill myself, but I was kept alive by my desire to collect the bones of my beloved. And only then end my life and my suffering. So I went looking around three times in every corner of this forest, and I found nothing but solitary horror. I came to believe that, that because her wedding day had arrived, she was afraid to return to her old father, and so left Tuscany. I decided to follow, led less by reason than by fate. And when I couldn't find her, I decided to return here, back to my unhappy homeland. So I saw the beautiful rays of my sun extinguished Chlorelli. And all my joy ended with it. What wretched events. Tragic enough to draw laments from these stones themselves. How your pain grieves me. How willingly I would trade my life and my blood itself to give Delinda life again. Alas, your weeping pierces my heart. Here, let me wipe your tears with this veil. Oh, wretched sight! Oh, what do I see? But perhaps it would be better to return to our father's house, where you oh, can rest more easily and recover from your fatigue after a long voyage. I don't think I should go after what I've just told you. So when do you want him to see you? Tomorrow at the very latest. In the meantime, tell our old father that you have news of my arrival and that you hope I will return to these parts shortly. I will do what you ask of me. In the meantime, keep me hidden, Clarilli. Okay. Fellini, oh, I cannot stop myself from embracing you. Oh, miserable Philemon! I hear a shepherd. Clarilli, farewell! Is this Philemon, eh? Surely it is he. Against my wishes, I must wait for him to please Armila. Oh, oh, you treacherous and cruel, oh, impure and undeserving nymph. Tell me, are you she who dares to call the most faithful shepherd in the world unfaithful? You are that unchaste nymph who, in order to follow Diana, scorns all men. Yet the immoral desires that you are hiding beneath that cloak of honesty shall be revealed, despite your attempts. Is this why you flee from me, in order to pursue others? Am I called disloyal? Am I a traitor without love, without faith? Oh, highest Jove, why do you hold back your burning arrows? Avenge this great deception and this fraud! Oh, what sweet opening lines! What a gentle lover! I must say, this isn't what I expected. <laughs> Nor did I think I should need to speak to you in such a manner, traitress. And yet I must, against my will. Are you mad, Philemone? What manner of speaking is this? Speak in a way I may also understand. You feign not to understand what you know most certainly. In my own eyes, not to see you clasp your new lover to your breast. What does it matter to you? Or what should it matter? <sighs> what should it matter? To see another man possess my sweet reward. To see in the hands of another what by her right should be mine. To see that she who is pitiless towards me, giving me only death, gives life to others. You ask why this matters. Yes, I do ask. What reward are you speaking of that you see in others' possession and that should be yours? What life and what death are you jabbering on about? You are that sweet reward that befits my long service. You, by the law of love, have already been mine for a long time. And you slay me when robbing me. You give yourself to others. If I had looked for or gratefully acknowledged your devotion, you would be right to ask for this reward. But I flee from it and I despise it. Serve another nymph, anyone who pleases you. As for life or death, I do not know what you mean by all this. I know that I do not desire or wish for your death, nor do I care a fig for your life. I know that all too well. Even if there was once a time when it seemed to mean something to you. If there was once a time, and I shall not deny it, when you were dear to me, it is also true that you gave me good reason to convert my love into hatred. Oh, cruel one, what reason can you possibly give other than you turned your heart to a new love? You are ashamed to reveal it as it would also reveal the ugly fault of your infidelity. You know quite well that I hate you. You also know quite well that if I loved you once, it's because you deserved it then. 
No less discourteous than unfaithful Philomone. Farewell, I've suffered quite long enough here. I take Glory, my leave. Glory, they last do not leave. Pardon, pardon this unfaithful tongue, which love and anger led astray, making me say what I did not mean. Listen a little while longer to these, the last words of my life. Here I am then, get on with it. Beautiful Chlorely, behold once more in this drained and deathly visage my heart portrays in all its torments. Here, you will read at least a part of my suffering. The other part my faint voice will tell, if it does not fade to silence amidst my agony and grief. More than a year ago, you deprived this wretched soul of that good that you once bestowed on it, as a gracious gift. Since that time, I shall not tell you what has been my state. But this will tell you something of how I feel. My breast has become a new inferno, home to the greatest of torments. Here, a great furnace sparks with real flames. And here, I fear the searing cold of bitter frost and so many other torments that even to speak of them, let alone to suffer them, brings unbearable pain. Yet here, amidst all these woes, sits your lovely image's queen, Lovely as Persephone on her frozen throne. You would place me in hell? Take me out of there, Philomone. Such a dark and shadowy chamber is not to my liking. I cannot take you out of there. But you, with your eyes, can make this same chamber tranquil and bright. <laughs> I am not as powerful as you think. Do I not know well the power of those two eyes? Whose two sons, rather whose power, of the light, power to light up chasms and nights, and you know this quite well yourself, but you prefer to keep the power of their rays for other places. Even if my eyes did have such value, do not think that I would wish to brighten your nights. Rather, if I ever see you, I will keep them closed or turn them elsewhere. If you mean to deprive me of those two eyes that can brighten my deep shade, Chlorely, leaving me to live on in eternal horror and grief, then I will close them, never to open them again. Philomone. Do not think your speeches will change my mind or desire. Farewell, peace be with you. Is this how you leave me in peace? Do you leave me thus, cruel one? At the moment of my death. <sighs> oh, beautiful Chlorely. With a single word, you could have shown yourself to be kind, at least to my death. But it is not enough for you, cruel one, for me to shed blood and die, unless my wretched soul also passes into the next life miserably. But you, you will not fully enjoy my death, which you showed yourself to have so longed for. Your delight and my cruel death will be tempered by the pain that you will feel at the death of your beloved and beautiful lover. With these very hands, I will open up his breast and pierce his heart with my arrow. But what are you ranting about, Philomone? What are you thinking? If, while you were in life with all your power, you were always trying to make her happy, why would you want to make her unhappy at the moment of your death? Let her fortunate lover live on, and let Philomone die without vendetta. And thus it pleases me to go amongst the infernal shadows. Farewell, woods! Farewell, hills. I go to die. Glory, Lee. Glory, Lee. Oh, Philmona, he, he moves so quickly as though he had wings. I had better follow him, for he seems to me so distraught that I suspect something terrible. Philmona, Philmona, don't leave. Wait, Philmona, don't miss it. Florinese Hodiscope will be the castle of Red 
the moon is there. I certainly do believe it, for when I arrived here, it was at the very instant that he was leaving. In a wild state, his face entirely changed in the color of death. Why didn't you follow him? I was quite ready to follow him, but he was moving so swiftly that I had lost sight of him right away. Why weren't you there? When he spoke to Crowley, perhaps you could have stopped this terrible event by tempering her pride and anger. That is why I accompanied Clarelli. But as it seemed to me that Philemonia was later than he should have been, I was worried that his usual fearfulness was holding him back. So I left to go get him and bring him here myself, but I couldn't find him. But you, who hover around your dear friend night and day, why did you abandon him when he was in his greatest need and allow him to go alone? Because that is what he wanted. Oh, unhappy shepherd, you certainly predicted his sad fate. If only I'd stayed quiet. Such is his prize in the end. He who makes love the master of the mind and the tyrant of the heart. Love, how different you seem from your usual self in this state. Did the archer in the past, you shot not lethal arrows from your bows, but vital thunderbolts, which sweetly wooden neither helmet nor shield. Yet these shepherd lovers happily offered up their bare and exposed breasts. And now, the beam of your torch flickers more dimly than a tiny candle in a bare, pale tomb. In your beautiful fire, love, souls used to renew themselves and find a happier life. But now the darts from your quiver, love, seem more like death's arrows. You, though not having a soul of your own, once kept hearts alive, yet now you let your most faithful lovers die? Have your arms, Lord love, perhaps lost that ancient power that once brought so much joy and happiness to hearts? Tell me, kind and courteous Lord, why did you change yourself into a cruel and disloyal tyrant, thirsty for blood and desiring only death? Love is not as changed as you believe, for he does not always bring sweetness. If our fears and tears are true, Rash Philemone teaches us through too harsh an example today. Alas, it is all too true, I'm afraid. Here comes the beast now. Here comes the ungrateful nymph herself. How proudly she comes after such an illustrious enterprise. I searched all over the forest for you, Armila. Finally, I found you. Tell me, pray, did you happen to see Philemone after I spoke with him? And what makes you ask news for him now? I fear something terrible has happened. For after I spoke with him, I was angry from our conversation. And, and as I headed to Tesbina's cave, I found this arrow of his, and Tesbina told me that she'd seen him running down to the Mignone River, and that he seemed out of his mind. Enjoy yourself now, wicked Clorini, for sadly these signs are true. Now see, cruel nymph, here are the miserable fruits of your cruelty. Here, at last, this noble and gallant shepherd will die because of you. Go. Go and live, cruel nymph. Live all alone and make the woods and forests cruel. Oh, unhappy lover. Is this the one for whom you leapt to your death? For one who is without pity, who won't even honor you with one small tear, even a sigh? He may not be dead, Armila. Do not fear. What have I to fear anymore if the worst is certain? Then what certainty do you have of his death? I've heard it said that every man escapes death if he can. <laughs> Yet, my life will be wretched, Armila. If it really is true that Philomone is dead. To the contrary. You'll be most joyous and happy, for he'll no longer harass you with his tiresome pleas. Do not say such cruel things. You torment my heart even more, which is already tormented with bitter pain. Oh, Mundo Cruel. I hear a voice, and it sounds most sorrowful. Oh, Philomone is itao. Do you really lie dead in the prime of your life? Alas, it is Arinda who speaks to Philomone, alas. Where are you coming from, shepherdess? And whose death were you lamenting? As I made my way here, I was lamenting the death of the most kind and faithful shepherd in these woods. It is Philomone of whom I speak. Will I die after hearing such horrible news? Tell us this woeful story, kind Arinda. If grief allows me enough spirit to do so, then I will willingly recount it. The more so, because I see here before me, she who was the cause of his death. Alas, I expected to die a thousand deaths because of your words. I was walking along the Mugnone, free of any worry, 
when I suddenly saw Philomone come running and cross the river. When he was halfway up the steep mountain which bears the name of the Son of Venus, he stopped. Quiet and still, he gazed down the horrible precipice. Finally, he raised his eyes, and his face seemed calm again. But then, a sigh escaped from so deep within, I was certain his soul would come along with it and accompany his words. Alas, alas. Oh, oh cruel Clorilli, just as I fell miserably from the heights of your grace into this abyss of extreme misery because of you, now my wretched body goes tumbling down from these great heights for the same reason, to find the deepest part of this horrid cliff. He then fell silent, and a torrent of the bitterest tears sprang from his eyes. Next, he pulled a white veil from his chest and fixed his gaze upon it. O oh, veil, how much change have I witnessed since the first I saw you, a fickle token of her promise. I beg you, stay here. He then tore the veil, as you can see, and threw it far away. And as if he were out of his mind, he tore his clothes with a deranged look on his face. He then turned to marble, and with his eyes full of death. My own, mar my own heart must be made of marble if it does not drown itself in lament. Are you still so foolish as to blame your nymph for infidelity? You, the one who robbed her of her promise and gave it to others. You, the treacherous one. You, the one who committed the grave offense. Yet you're still alive. And your nymph, your beautiful nymph, remains unavenged. Ah, uh, die, die, you wretch, and let your vows die with you as well. O oh, Clorilli, Philemone at last avenges your honor. O oh, Clorilli, here. I die. And with these words, he quickly threw himself to the bottom. Unhappy shepherd. You loved sincerely, and death was your prize. Pitiless grief. Why do you not kill me? Perhaps to you, pity seems to keep a monster of misery alive. Or do you want me to avenge my sweet beloved with this arrow? I am ready to obey you. I am ready to follow you. Oh, Philomone, whom I love in death, though I despised him while he was alive. But perhaps his iron sword did not have power against my iron heart. For this breast of mine is truly of savage temper, and he was not able to soften it with such a long lament. And you, Armila, why do you delay in avenging Philomone's death? I was that cruel beast who longed for his death. I led him to the precipice on the mountain's peak. I, a treacherous nymph, threw him down to the ground below. You, who loved him in life, avenge him now in death. Here is his arrow which its master only gave to open up my heart at last and fiercely torture my cruel heart. Here, I offer it to you, defenseless and naked. Why, why do you not believe it? Oh, miserable nymph, your pity has come too late. You have realized it all too late. Now you must live unhappily, live and suffer this torment as reward for your truly wicked mistake. You cruelly deny me then that which is due to me for so many reasons. I, who am responsible for the deaths of others, now find death's door closed to me. But why? This hand of mine, which refused to trust my faithful shepherd, will now plunge the arrow into my own What do you think you're doing? Oh, unhappy Clarelli. If I had waited any longer, she certainly would have killed herself. Do not leave me this arrow! Do not stop me, Armila! For this obedient hand is servant to my just desire and will do what you cruel one refuse to do! Uh, give me this arrow, shepherdess! Help me wrench it from her head! Hand it over, wretched nymph! Don't try to kill Philomona yet again with your death. But instead, 
Keep his memory alive within you. Live secure in the knowledge that he loved you as he showed you by dying. If he still loves me, then there is good reason for me to follow him. But give me back that veil, Arenda. It is a miserable sign of his just furor. To that end, stay with me the short stretch of life that has left me. Aquí lo tienes. But I beseech you to abandon these thoughts. They will lead you down a path of madness to death. Give me back the arrow. Oh, do not think I will ever give it back to you to make good on such a crazy, inhuman idea. Fine. I'll leave it with you then. And go and satisfy my just desire and find wretched Philmoni's body. Because she can do nothing who is already dead and cannot die. Shepherdess, I must follow her and stop her by God. So, and tell him the horrible news of his son's deadly fate. Oh, may the heavens be blessed. For even if Philomone has been strange for life today, they still console and reward us by giving us the Linda back alive and healthy. The fact that I live, Corabante, is the most terrible and unjust destiny. But, my beloved Dalinda, why were you so far away from us for such a long time? If the memory does not grow too painful, I shall tell you everything. You must remember how I nearly went out of my mind from extreme pain when Alcone wanted to join me in a loveless marriage with Philomone. I remember it all, but I could never understand why you rejected such a worthy chef so, so forcefully. Oh, forgive me, kind Corbante, if I kept the flame that love had lit in my heart hidden from you. But there is more risk that it would turn things to ash. I know you know my Felinio. Felinio, the pride of these woods and the glory of Fiozole's mountains. It is he who my heart burned for. If the flame was the same, the cause was the same. We were so happy for one moment, until the heavens decided that they would change my condition from happy to unhappy. Because I would not willingly agree to the loveless marriage my father had so decided, I promised my Felinio I would become his bride. And just as I held immense love for him, so he gave his love to me. Telling that that was the crazy device of mad love. We agreed to meet that night by this fountain. I arrived before him, while waiting in this deserted place. A horrible bear appeared and came charging at me, a crazy and ravenous fury. Terrified and with no way to defend myself, I, I fled to this cave and I hid there almost until morning when love came surging back out stronger than ever in place of my fear and I returned here to find my Felinio. Alas, I did find him, but alas, not as I was hoping. Remembering it now, I tear at my face and my breast. He was lying, covered on his own blood, on the earth, dead. Oh, wretched me, worthy of eternal pain and eternal lament. I found him, alas, dead. And yet, cruel fate would deny me the chance to view his lovely face. For all that was left of him were his blonde locks. Tell me, does the wretched shepherd have any other chase that allow you to recognize him as Felinio? None others. Now console yourself. Because the suspicions you had about the death of Felinio may still be proven wrong. For the shepherd I saw today was the shepherd called El Castle, whom I saw fighting with a bear the same night. I saw the fear kill him. Oh, but my aching heart would recognize my lover. It would not have felt so much pain for anyone but my Felinio. I'm sure that your grief will be soon disproven. Believe me, Dalinda. And I'll tell that to the contrary. I suspect that Felinio is still alive and in these woods. Your sympathy is cruel if you're trying to keep me alive with false hope. I'm not trying to uh, keep you alive as false, false hope. All right. <sighs> I am, I am most certain, I am most sure of my misfortune. But if it shall please you, Corbante, I shall wait here. But come back quickly, I beg of you. I will go now, don't leave before I return. Oh, uncertain hope, do not make a nest of yourself in this troubled breast of mine. Leave, you are not welcome here. For I saw my Felino's life extinguished at this very fountain. Here, 
I saw a stream of tepid blood form. And alas, I see that the flowers still hold a scarlet hue on their petals. You, fountain, reveal my fierce pain's bitter history to all. I, who was so ready to abandon my fatherless, comfortless house to follow you, is it still too late to follow you, sweetest Felinio? And forgive me, heart of mine, but I am kept alive only against my will. You, fountain, reveal my fierce pain's bitter history to all. I, who am spirited and strong, and who have destroyed the most terrible form of every danger. How could I have fear to bear? You, fountain, reveal my fierce pain's bitter history to all. And yet, I am kept alive by still more false hope. You, fountain, Reveal my short life's bitter history to all. In the short time that I have left to live, all that I want is for Corabante to come back. And then I shall sadly follow you, my sweetest Felinio. In the meantime, I shall hide myself inside of that cave. Buongiorno fortunato. Oh, fortunate day. Happy day, bright and happy day. Ah, it is fitting that I write you into hard marble. Delinda is alive. Felino has been found. Philomone is not dead. And Clarelli's hatred has been converted into love. Oh, happy events. Ah, Che felicità, gentle Corabante! Oh, how, how happy it makes my heart! But, Belinda, where is she? For surely she said that she would meet you in precisely this place. She can't be far, no, she should be long in coming. But in the meantime, my Casta, how did you say Filimone? <laughs> After his fall from that high cliff, we are Alinda told that she saw him. Arinda speaks the truth, for Filimone was about to plummet to his death, but kind fate opposed his desperate wish. As I will tell you. Tell me, for I'm all years. There. I was lying along the Munyane, along the fresh green grass, <coughs> flirting with sweet slumber so that it might restore my tired body, when suddenly a loud and most frightening cry pierced my ear, chasing slumber away. There. A man was tumbling down from the top of that mountain. When I think about it, I go cold and tremble. A man fell from that high ravine to the foot of that tall mountain, where the little river was brimming with so much water that it seemed to become a little pool. He fell just there. I flung myself in and swam a short distance through the waves. Then I managed to thrust him onto the bank, and I placed his body on the grass. I realized that his, he was still breathing lightly. As I managed to work him fully, I heard a lady's sad lament coming from a higher ground nearby. There was Alfezi Bayo's daughter coming down quickly toward us, being palm against palm, and crying out for Philomone's name in a loud voice. <sighs> she ran down the slope and threw herself onto Philomone. Oh, what a piteous sight it was. The tears that fell from Clarilli's eyes onto Philomone's face. He revived himself. And then he looked at Clarili, and thus she looked at him, and thus they looked at each other again, quietly, without moving. Then, at the same moment, two such sighs escaped from their mouths and met together so strongly that I was sure that both of their souls were leaving the world to go to heaven together. <sighs> Clarili, falling again with abandon, joined her beautiful face to his. And Philomone, moving his arms, he pulled currently tightly to his chest. And now that she was sure he was happily alive, she sat him up onto the grass with such joy that with the signs of love and sweet loving words from one to another, the ardent fire in their hearts was reignited. 
Here I will stop, for one cannot hope to understand such feelings, nor recount them to others. <sighs> oh, fortunate lovers, heaven concerns pure faith, chaste love, and happy life eternally in you. But, Melikata, may you double this joy which you bring to my heart by telling me news of feeling in you as well. Has he also been found today? Well, while those adventurous lovers were recounting their old loves and old adventures, Philomone asked Clurili, who was that shepherd who had kindly saved her from danger? She responded that it was Felinio, her brother who love had long made absent and who was returning now from exile to see his homeland again. <sighs> My dear Felinio, are you really alive? But where might I find him? For I would like to see this happy day meet even have here through a double wedding. I do not know where exactly to tell you, but from the common cry, my guess is he's at the Fiesole Mountain with new spouses and other nymphs and shepherds competing in sports and games. But since I do not see Delinda coming from anywhere, I should delay no longer in giving this news to Clarice and Philomone's fathers, for it will be with their children that will deliver the news. Allora, me ne vale tornerò per trovare a Delinda. Go on, and if by any chance you happen to see into Filinio, tell him that the Linda and I are looking for him. Ci vediamo. Ci vediamo. A presto, amica. But where could the Linda have gone? Why do I not see her anywhere? Perhaps out of fear of being seen, she has hidden herself. Or else? Fearing that the news I give of him, of seeing her dear Filinio, was false, she fled again. Or else, the day the heavens make bitter poison out of happiness. Corabante is never coming back, and I am destroyed, melted like a snowflake by a ray of sun. Where could Belinda have gone? Where has she hidden herself? Corabante? Corabante! Eccola, a key. Oh, echo tea. Oh, may the heavens be blessed, for they have kindly granted my wishes. Delinda, your Felinio is alive. He's healthy. He's happy. My Felinio is alive? And your Felinio is alive. The day he was out here searching for you, and his sister Cronia confirms it. And he wants to see me? And he wants to see me. And he's melting with desire, consumed with thy desire to see you again. Oh, happiest day, happy and cheerful day, foretold for my pleasure, a day that has granted my heart's dearest desire. You shall return to me, always merry, always dear. Thus, may your beautiful calm skies never be shadowed by a cloudy tempest. Instead, may you always be flowers blossoming along these slopes, the young couple dancing merrily around this fountain, which will render this day most momentous. And you, clear, fresh waters, may thirsty herds never disturb your tranquil waves. Instead, may Diana and her beautiful nymphs take refuge here from the blazing heat and bathe their limbs in your calm springs. Oh, who will give me a new heart where I may house this happiness of mine? For mine has become so accustomed to pain that it might not remember happiness. Oh, happy to Linda. Today these eyes will be blessed by the sweet sight of you, my Felinio. And these are the happiest of pains, if they are to see him again. And you, O oh Lydia, it's because of you that I experience this newfound joy. You, who took me in through your sacred rites. It's because of you that I am alive. Blessed be the day that you found me, and blessed be the days that I lived with you. So you were with the priestess Lydia in the goddess sacred cave the whole time for the moment we lost you? I was in her abode the entire time from the moment I falsely believed my Felinio dead. I was most destroyed, ready to kill myself. Noble Lydia, may you always be happy and cheerful. But who is this Jephthah I see running towards us who is so festive and happy? Why, it's a noble Olinda. Oh, hermosa Olinda. Is it really true that you've come to make Fiesole more beautiful with your most lovely face? Oh, gracious Sorinda. Yes, as you can see, the heavens have returned me to these woods, to these beloved hills. But tell me, my Felinia, what news of him? 
I come from Augusto's home. Filinho has arrived with Clarilli Filimoni and an infinite flock of shepherds and nymphs. And he's most happy as his sister has become Filimoni's bride. But he's even happier for your return. And not only is he consumed with desire to see you, but everyone's desperate to see you. So why delay it any longer? Love, lend me your wings so I can fly to where my happiness is, to where my heart is. Let's go, uh, Dalinta. Allora, go. andiamo. Alla festa, alla festa, andiamo. Who would have thought that by falling, Filimone would have reached the summit of his happiness, and that by wandering, Filinio would have found such repose and peace after such a hard and long exile. Oh, how love's ways are hidden to the mortal man. But ah, may my shepherd never wish to test thy love in such a perilous way. For faith is acquired through whispering laments and begging for mercy. Ma eccoli là! Vamos a mirar como bailan todos. O bailan todos, o no baila nadie. Let's go. 